Anyone ever seen this map before? A couple of people, a few people have. This is a fascinating map. Um, it was, it was uh, originally made back in the uh, late 1800s. And uh, the history behind this map is, is pretty fascinating, to say the least. I want to zoom up to the top here and see what it says here. It says, Gleason's new standard map of the world as it is, is what he says there. As it is. This is supposed to be the world as it is, according to this Gleason, whoever this Gleason is. Well, let's look at Gleason. This is he. His name is Alex or Alexander Gleason. That's him. That's a blown up picture of that map. And um, this has pretty much been the map that has been um, embraced by most people that believe that the Earth is not a sphere, but a flat plane, more of a flat plane. Well, it's interesting if you look a little closer at this Mr. Gleason, he's also an author. He wrote a, a very fascinating book here. It says, Is the Bible from Heaven? Question mark. Is the Earth a globe? So he wrote um, a nice book on this topic. I think it's interesting that he says right here on the cover, scientifically, theologically demonstrated. I like that. I really like that. Scientifically, I'm not saying that all science is bad, right? There's true science and there's pseudoscience. Theologically demonstrated. And he is the one that uh, made this map. Well, who is this guy? By the way, um, this is a link online that you can go to and you can read that book, Is the Bible from Heaven? Well, interesting history about him. Uh, this gentleman here with this awesome beard. I mean, that is an awesome beard. Uh, and then this is another interesting uh, gentleman here that we'll be talking about more in just a minute. But that's, uh, that's Alexander Gleason, uh, Gleason rather. And um, this is where it gets really interesting. This is at a New York conference mission in Buffalo. Buffalo, New York. Alex Gleason is responsible or is the one that started the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Buffalo, New York. He is a Seventh-day Adventist. Was. He's, of course, passed away. But he's the one that came up with that map. And Alex Gleason, very smart man, he was a blacksmith, obviously an author, he invented, he has uh, at least two patents that I'm aware of. Um, very smart man. And very, an important man within the Seventh-day Adventist organization in his day. At his burial, the conference was involved. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, the New York Conference president even did his funeral, if I'm not mistaken. So he was if you want to say a flat earther from way back. And um, he was a good, faithful Seventh-day Adventist till the day he died, as far as I know. He, was, he, was, uh, he actually uh, worked in the New York Conference uh, as the, in charge of the missions for uh, about three years. 87, I think it was 1887 to 1890, somewhere around in there. Those dates may not be completely accurate, but nonetheless. Um, this is another picture of the conference. That was in Syracuse, New York, the camp meeting there. And uh, these are all the different ministers. Um, now, um, as far as I know, I don't believe that Alex um, Gleason was a minister himself, although he did travel around and he did preach this message of the flat plane earth. He did do that. 
And at this is very interesting. At this, um, these camp meetings, he was uh, he worked very closely with uh, A.E. Place. And at this camp meeting, they actually took a vote. And um, we're going to see what that vote was here in just a second. Any of you uh, familiar with this gentleman here, Dudley Canwright? Well, Dudley Canwright, um, it's a very sad story what happened with Dudley Canwright. Um, he, was, uh, he was a minister. He worked very closely with Ellen White and James White. He actually lived with them for a time, worked very, very closely. They were dear, dear friends for some 27 years. Well, at some point, Ellen White gave him some rebuke for something he was doing. And he became embittered about that. And um, he began to uh, join up with his Sunday keeping friends. And he joined their, their movement as opposed to the Seventh day Adventist one. He actually wrote this book, Seventh day Adventism Renounced. You can find that book online right there. And um, of course, for those online, I'll be posting up the link for it. But it's very sad that he was with the, the church for so long and so closely connected in friendship and working together with Ellen and James White to uh, have fall, fallen away so much. But in his book, he has, um, he has a, a little bit of a jab at the ones who are, were at that conference there where they took a vote. Well, here it is. I've got it underlined here. The latest discovery is that that adopted by Seventh-day Adventist ministers of the New York Conference. It is that the earth is absolutely flat and stationary with the sun, moon, and stars much smaller than the earth and revolving around it. The sun, he do move, the old dark he said, and they say, Amen. So he was very much against the flat earth, flat plane um, theology. And he was throwing jabs at them because at that conference, they took a vote and they voted in the New York conference, they voted to accept the flat earth, this right here. They voted that as Seventh-day Adventist. And it's interesting too, um, the sun he do move. That was a quote from a Baptist minister. He was a, he was a black man. Uh, John Jasper was his name. And um, he had a very popular message at that time uh, entitled, The Sun He Do Move, because he believed also that the earth was a flat stationary plane and that the sun, moon, and stars evolved around the earth. So this was, can you see the kind of spirit that this man had? He was, he was making fun. He was mocking, okay? He was mocking the leaders at that time. I'm reading a chapter from Alex Gleason's book, Is the Bible from Heaven? Is the Earth a Globe? Chapter 20, Closing Considerations, A Peculiar People, A uh, Thus Saith the Lord, Truth and the Glory of God Inseparable, pages 382 through 391. Chapter 20. There is a people scattered abroad throughout the earth with whom I have had an acquaintance for over 30 years who claim to be the antitypical Israel, the depositaries of God's laws. They believe the promises are due to them on this wise. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. Galatians 3, 7 Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and unto seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. 16th verse And if ye be Christ's, 
Then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3.29 This people also believe that they are giving the last notes of warning prior to the appearance of him of whom it was said, whom the heavens must receive until the restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3.21, Matthew 24.14, Daniel 2.44, 7.27. The latter quotation covers complete their anticipated hopes and joys of this present life and that which is to come. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Christ. Further, this people claim to be giving that everlasting gospel styled the third angel's message of Revelation 14, 6-12. Some prominent ones among this people have taught that this subject of the shape of the earth was no part of the third angel's message and therefore no part of the truth for them to receive. Consequently, they are to have nothing to do with it. It has been an adage with some truth-loving people that an unpopular truth was more acceptable than a popular error. We do find some, sorry to say, that cling to the popular error at the sacrifice of the unpopular truth. While some are declaring that they have nothing to do with the matter, yet we still hear them preaching the earth a globe and are teaching it from their high schools and colleges. Now, this has long been their motto, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8.20 Having briefly noticed the future hope and reward of this people, we wish their forbearance while we notice the characteristics they are to bear. We would not, by these words, assume the prerogative of a leader or a teacher of this people. God's word will teach and lead all that will be led or taught by it. But allow me to call attention to that which is your delight and that which so many of you know so well. We ask, what was to be the character of the church when presented to the Master? Ephesians 5.27 will tell us plainly, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Is the remnant to teach the truth only? We will let Zephaniah 3.13 answer. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. Allow a few more citations. What does the angel say to St. John? Revelation 14, last clause of the fourth verse. These were purchased from among men to be the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. 5. And in their mouth was found no lie. They are without blemish. The revelator says, 
Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. He also says that without are every one that loveth and maketh a lie. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. Psalm 15, 1 and 2 Actions many times speak louder than words, then, this being true, may not inspiration refer to the same? Yes, or taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Last clause, third verse. I understand by this, he who carries reports, whether he can sustain them or not by the word, does it at a peril. The Lord says by the prophet Zechariah, These are the things ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Zechariah 8.18 8, Then can we teach our neighbors or family that which is not truth? and be clear in the sight of heaven, and further say that the Bible was not given to teach astronomy, and that it makes no difference to me whether this earth is flat or round? True, it may not make any difference to us in regard to its shape, but it will make a difference whether we speak, think, act, and teach the truth or a lie. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. If we earnestly desire, seek, and strive for it, the Spirit of Truth will guide us unto all truth. See John 16, 13. Then, in view of even the very few declarations above given, do not say that the message and mission that we have to perform is separated from any truth necessary for us to believe and maintain against the author and the refuse of lies which are to be swept from the earth. In order to harmonize the scriptures to suit modern science, falsely so called, the world has gone contrary to all true principles of interpretation. Thus have they made the literal rendering of no effect we give an extract taken from an editorial in The Signs of the Times for May 19, 1890. Number one, the Bible does not simply contain the truth, but it is the truth and the whole truth. And whatever disagrees with the Bible, whether it be in the realms of morals or science, must be false. Number two, when a position taken in regard to any text is consistent with the entire Bible, that of itself is evidence that the position is correct. Number three, the Bible must interpret itself. It cannot need the addition of matter outside of itself. Terms used in one place in the Bible with a certain signification must have the same meaning attached to them in every other place where they occur.
provided the same subject is under consideration. We say, Amen. On the above principles, let us examine a few texts of the Word. And if we cannot maintain the above principles, then let us forever cease to contend or maintain the literality of the Scriptures and meekly take our position with that class of investigators spoken of in 2 Timothy 3.7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. A. Joshua 10, 12, and 13. When Joshua spoke to the Lord and commanded the sun and moon to stand still, did he mean the earth? B. 13th verse. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed. Is it true? Or did the earth stand still? Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Proverbs 36 C. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. In speaking of the glory of the heavens, the psalmist says, In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and is circuit unto the ends of it. Could our globe friends find such a testimony as this in the scriptures for their side of the question, we would have to acknowledge that we knew of no rules of interpretation for the word of God. Has inspiration used a medium through which to communicate to mortals that would use other words than his and words calculated to deceive? I cannot believe it. This would-be science tells and teaches that it is the earth and not the sun that moves. Then why not say so in that word that describes the glory of the heavens? Is it in the heavens that he has set a tabernacle for the earth? Is it the earth whose going forth is from the end of heaven and is circuit unto the ends of it? D. But tenacious for your early instructions and not content with other positive evidence to the contrary, you refer me to Job 26.7, which says, he stretches out the north over in the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Dr. A. Clark says that the Chaldean version renders it thus, He layeth it upon the waters, nothing sustaining it. This harmonizes with Psalm 24 too, For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. E. Psalm 78.69 says, And he built his sanctuaries like high places, like the earth which he has established, margin founded forever. F. Does God here compare his tabernacle or sanctuary dwelling places, synonymous terms, to something that was flying through space faster than a cannonball and turning around at the same time at a rate of more than a thousand miles per hour? Or should we understand him to mean the sun 
when he said earth? G. But he hangeth it upon nothing, is what you claim. Yes, and so do I. He done just as he said he did, founded upon the seas, nothing sustaining it. Nothing is a non-entity, then no human thing sustained it. You next demand the foundation of the seas. Well, I will give you just what God says about that, and I do not think that I am authorized to go beyond, for the secret things belong unto the Lord, our God, but those things which are revealed in his word belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Deuteronomy 29.29 29. Now, the prophet Jeremiah will be responsible for the following declarations, for he declares that it is a thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, If heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 35-37 Yes, truly we may infer from the declarations of God himself and his infinite works and wisdom that if finite man, the work of his hands, formed of the dust, can search out infinity, then infinity has no more use for him, and he is independent of him who formed him. We can only say in conclusion, and this with the utmost confidence, and with God's word to sustain us, that first, there is foundation beneath. Second, the heavens of heavens are above also, the everlasting bounds of ice that cover the deep are below the heavens. The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Job 38.30 Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Job 38, 18. He has compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. Job 26, 10. The RV has it thus. He hath described a boundary upon the face of the waters unto the confines of light and darkness. We cannot refrain from a few remarks on these harmonious quotations. There is no ambiguity here. There is no evading the conclusions if honestly considered by those who revere the Word of God. First, it is true that day and night do not come to an end at the north, for it is well known to those living in Spitsbergen 
as shown heretofore in this book, that there is three and a half months day. Therefore, when day begins, night ends, and vice versa. Then, no spot on this earth north of the equator does night and day end. But the infallible word of God says that those confines or bounds are upon the face of the waters. Now, if the bounds are on the face of the waters, certainly they are the one side or the other of the equator. That path or bounds no bird of prey knoweth, neither hath the falcon's eye seen it. The proud beasts have not trodden it, nor hath the fierce lion passed thereby. Job 28, 7 and 8, RV Sir James Ross advanced to 78 degrees 10 minutes south and there traversed a wall of ice estimated to be a thousand feet thick and from 150 to 200 feet high for 450 miles without a crack or crevice sufficient for a rowboat. Gave up the search for any passage and returned. No human being before nor since has passed that wall God in his wisdom built, and he has said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thou proud waves be stayed. Job 38, 11. In conclusion, suffer a few words, though in substance it has been repeated in this book, they have reference to the northern bounds as compared to the south. The North Polar Basin is circumscribed by the line of 80 degrees. Within the latter is the open polar sea, which is nearly 1,000 miles in diameter. Sir Edward Perry, with open boats, advanced in it toward the north to the latitude of 82 degrees 45 minutes or to the proximity of 435 miles from the center, the nearest point ever reached by man. This was between 1827 and 1829. Since that time, on May 13, 1883, Lieutenant James B. Lockwood and Sergeant Brainerd pushed north to 83 degrees 24 minutes. See following article by Mr. Lovell. The current flowing south was so rapid that it completely neutralized the northward progress affected by rowing, and the unsuccessful attempt was abandoned. Dr. Hayes reached 81 degrees 35 minutes, or within 505 miles. Mr. Morton of Kane's expedition attained 81 degrees 22 minutes, or within 518 geographical miles. Both Hayes and Morton, as far as they could observe, found no ice, but on the contrary, a warm open sea. Birds were flying north. Snow had melted from the mountains, leaving them clad only with a thin covering of ice. The established line of greatest cold on the American continent is 700 miles south of the North Pole, and on the Asiatic 625 miles south. Professor F. Miller's great lecture, Harmony of the Bible and Natural Philosophy, page 45. 
We have seen by the above where the north boundary or limit of cold existed and passed that extreme into a place inhabited by the birds of a genial climate to an open sea. And there we leave those considerations of the two extremes of north and south. There remains another passage that has been misconstrued to prove the earth a globe and has went the rounds of the papers but has no bearing whatever. In order to show this, we will take its connections. We will first look at Job 38.12. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? Thirteenth, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? Fourteenth, it is changed as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. In the new version, the fourteenth verse reads, It is changed as clay under the seal, and all things stand as a garment. Tao version reads, Twelfth verse, Didst thou since thy birth command the morning and show the dawning of the day its place? Fourteenth, the seal shall be restored as clay and shall stand as a garment. Fifteenth, from the wicked their light shall be taken away. How these expressions can be made to apply to anything but the light and its source is beyond my comprehension. I will now close my remarks by quoting a few short paragraphs from a writer well known to all of that people of which I have referred. The truth and the glory of God are inseparable. It is impossible for us with the Bible within our reach to honor God by erroneous opinions. Many claim that it matters not what one believes if his life is only right. But the life is molded by the faith. If light and truth are within our reach and we neglect to improve the privilege of hearing and seeing it, we virtually reject it. We choose darkness rather than light. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 16.25 Ignorance is no excuse for error or sin when there is every opportunity to know the will of God. Great Controversy, page 597 in Revelation 21:22, referring to the New Jerusalem after it had descended to the New Earth, the Revelator says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The 23rd verse, latter clause says, For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. In 22, third verse, we read, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. In great controversy, Edition of 1888, pages 676 through 678, are the following remarks upon the above references. The people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. Now we see through a glass darkly, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We behold the image of God reflected as in a mirror, 
in the works of nature and in his dealings with men. But then we shall see him face to face without a dimming veil between. With undimmed vision they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order circling the throne of the deity. Now we ask if anyone can so construe the above quotations and language spoken as to place the throne of God and his Son anywhere else than on this earth when the restitution of all things shall have taken place. Advocate it who will. I cannot. In preparing this work for the public, the author has aimed for the diffusion of that class of knowledge and information which in its nature should contribute to liberty of the God-given conscience. If this effort shall contribute to enlarge our views and destroy prejudice, I feel assured that I shall receive the most gratifying reward for the few laborious days which have been devoted to the task of gathering these, disconnected though they may be, yet vital and important facts. January 1893, Alex Gleason, 1201 Niagara Street, Buffalo, New York, USA. People gave ear to an upstart astrologer, Copernicus, who strove to show that the earth revolves, not the heavens, or the firmament, the sun, and the moon. This fool wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy, but sacred scripture tells us, Joshua 10:13, that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still, and not, the earth.